Hi, good afternoon and welcome to the National Association for Court Management and Tyler Technologies webinar today. Today's session is titled, How an AI Document Automation Can Turbocharge Court Data, Accuracy and Efficiency. This is gonna to prove to be a very informative session and the webinar will be thought provoking. You will learn how you can turbocharge your AI enabled documents and understand the reshaping of the justice system. Before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the National Association for Court Management, also known as NACOM. As you see on the screen, here's a link that you can click to join our membership. Also, you can email us at membership at nacomnet.org. But NACOM is a member organization dedicated to educating court professionals, providing community, sharing information, and advocating for important court and justice system topics. There are several benefits to being a member. First off is our Court Express, which is our quarterly newsletter. We have a court manager, which is a quarterly journal with several topics of interest and in more depth and detail than the Court Express. You can have one-on-one -on -one mentorship, be a mentee or a mentor, and you can learn from experienced court professionals. It also brings together a community of court professionals, not just in the United States, but across the world. There's opportunities to serve on several committees and learn about new and interesting topics. There's opportunities to serve on the NACOM board or to serve in some other capacity for NACOM. You also get discounted registration for the annual mid-year conference. And I also want you to take particular notice that there are some scholarships available for the NACOM conference that's gonna be coming up in July. We welcome you to apply and join. And also, if you value NACOM, spread the word, let them know, nominate somebody, and there are also membership scholarships for NACOM. So please check that out. Our next few agenda items and dates we'd like you to save are our next webinar is going to be on the core leadership, which is April 22nd at 3 p.m. Eastern. This is part of our core champion program. So you can gain credit for that. If you wanna learn more about it, emails will be coming out. Then as I spoke earlier, our annual conference is July 21st through the 25th at the New Orleans Hilton Riverside. And during that conference, we'll be releasing our AI guide and we will be releasing an update for our court security guide. So, before we get started, we're gonna go over a few housekeeping things. Number one is duration of the webinar will be approximately 45 minutes. We'll have some questions and answers. The webinar is being recorded right now. So you will have the opportunity to go back and view it. It'll be found on the NACOM website. And then the questions you can post underneath the questions tab in the section and we'll answer the questions and answers at the end of this session. We also want you to be aware that um, you can learn more about any of the services that you hear today. And you can click the link at the back and select yes at the end of the prompting. And you will be contacted by Tyler Technologies today. So thank you. I wanted to let you know that today our speaker is Henry Sell. He is the founder of Computing Systems Innovations and now the Senior Director of AI Automation for Tyler Technologies. He boasts a four decade career in software development. His leadership extends to overseeing CSI's state-of-the-art artificial intelligence, which is used to automate court document workflows He's an esteemed member of AIM, PREA, and the PDF Association. Henry is a two-time AIM Award recipient, bringing his expertise 
as a guest speaker on machine learning and document processing to events hosted by AIM and PRIA and the PDF Association, along with NACOM and the National Center of State Courts. We welcome Mr. Sal. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, you can see my screen. You can hear me. Let's get started. Um, the title of this was kind of long. It was court document understanding and automating data efficiencies and things of that nature. Um, I tend to think of this, uh, our solution is making your staff happy. Um, the reason being is I get up every day and I have to look at my emails and I have to endlessly do things that somebody else is directing me to do. And it's a pretty boring job. I don't get to interact with humans. I get to talk to a machine and emails. And can you imagine what your staff is doing when they have to review documents every single day? I mean, at some point in time, it was necessary, but over the past several years, those times have changed and it's no longer necessary. So what we're gonna get started with is we're gonna give you a little bit of a CSI Tyler introduction, go into demonstrating the solution or a piece of the solution, which will be end-to-end -end e filing showing you what's also very special about this machine learning or artificial intelligence that we've created called online learning, where the system essentially teaches itself when it doesn't have enough data that it was trained on. So essentially it builds its knowledge up over time, gets smarter, just like a, a student with learning. We're gonna share some results from some of our clients, which is their return on investment, essentially it breaks down into dollars and cents over your investment in terms of what they've been saving. And once again, I'm pushing staff happiness. We're so far beyond speeds and feeds in terms of what the technology is capable of doing. And the bottom line is it gets rid of um, boring work that humans don't really need to do anymore. And then of course, we're gonna get into what's new for this year. Um, the concept of using graphic processing units or the AI hardware, um, or hardware especially designed for AI. And we'll tell you what the speeds are nowadays. It's pretty unbelievable when we get down to it. We're gonna get into real world court examples and also land record examples of what the new AI algorithms called large language models does. Talk about our new software release, completely redone technology from the past two years, it's called release 6.x. We're gonna talk about the concept of actually automating the AI modeling. So the systems can be started up a whole lot quicker than previously before. And then talk briefly about what we're doing in the redaction space. Yes, we still do redaction and we have some interesting AI that does restricted covenants and also cannabis and sovereign citizens. Um, some of it's court, some of it's line records. But anyway, CSI, I started many, many years ago, way before 2003, actually in the 1980s. But in 2003, we picked up redaction for one of our clients, Marion County, uh, Florida, sitting in the clerk's office. They asked us if we could redact information off their public records. And of course, we said yes. And then we went to figure out how we had to do it. Process we ended up with a lot of counties using our technology. Over the years, some of our customers said, hey, this technology is really great for finding data off of documents to redact, but can we actually use it to leverage to extract information so we can minimize our data review and our data entry when we're putting documents into our system? And we said, yes, of course. And we took our legacy technology, which was based on regular expressions, and we actually made it so that we find data off of line records and then court documents. It worked for a while, it was fragile. As the documents changed, the regular expressions, which is a very arcane programming language, had to be modified constantly. So it was highly maintenance intensive. We decided we we're going to use artificial intelligence and machine learning in the early 2015 years. And we ended up with a product that we released in our first customer at Palm Beach County in 2018 was the very first county to ever process e-filings without humans ever looking at documents. They're currently still our customer and they're one of our return on um, investment case studies you'll see at the tail end of this presentation. But essentially it was documents coming in from a submitter, completely reviewed by AI and decisions made by the AI technology, whether it needed to go to a human or could be automatically updated. But bottom line is e-filings don't have to be looked at by humans anymore for document intake, neither do scan documents or emails as well. Along the way on the top, we have different states that we've won um, awards on or the RFPs on. And in the middle of last year, Tyler Technologies had this interesting idea that they wanted to acquire a technology. So CSI is now a fully owned division operating within Tyler's enterprise justice um, system. And we've done, along the way, of course, automating file and serve and enterprise justice. But we have 12 other CMS vendors and e-filing systems that we automate with IntelliDirect AI. 
And the acquisition of Tyler did not stop that. It actually increased it because we've added a couple more to our mix. And the AI that we're gonna be talking about and showing is not just for case management systems. We're also automating a public defender system. It's called um, Defender Data in the state of Florida. We, the green guys, the green little boxes are new automations that have not been announced or maybe we haven't told everybody about. Um, we're actually operating um, and automating property and tax records for New York City. We're doing arrest reports for enterprise supervision, a enterprise justice product, supervision that is. We're also doing invoice processing for on-base um, at different customers at the same time. So it's not just CMS document exchange, it's any place you have high volumes of data entering your system off of paper documents or electronic documents. And on the bottom, we've been doing line record automation for auto indexing for several years right at present. Okay, so let's talk about our bread and butter. Um, this is what we did at first. This was the Palm Beach project. It wasn't the Tyler project. It was the state of Florida it was using the submitter portal and we were using showcases, the back end CMS. But Tarrant County, Texas in 2022 was our first and an e-filing automation enterprise justice workflow customer. And what we did was the manual process. Let me see if I could move this around a little bit and give you some screen data here. My apologies. I'll move that down there. Okay. So the manual review process that occurs in an e-filing and CMS update is pretty simple. A submitter enters documents into a portal, then some clerk signs onto the portal and they review the envelopes, they accept or reject them. And then based upon what the actions are, if the clerk accepts them, the e-filing system sends them over to the CMS. That takes typically, and we've done research on this using file and serve data throughout the United States, about 3.5 minutes per envelope coming into the system that a human is doing that task. So if we could eliminate using AI, you now have 3.5 minutes of human time left that don't need to be used for looking at documents coming into an e-filing portal. Once a transaction is accepted on the e-filing portal, based upon the docker code, possibly somebody has to do something else when it enters your CMS. And it's not just a Tyler CMS, it could be one of the 12 CMSs that we talked about earlier. And it could actually be multiple CMSs. So that if you're using, let's say, Tyler for civil, but you're using somebody else for criminal, doesn't matter, the automations work the same way. The robots actually um, go ahead and they do updates to different CMSs. But bottom line is, you have an e-filing transaction that came in, the human being on the front end did the acceptance to say, yep, the documents are followed correctly, they're the right docket codes, they're the right documents, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a child support reinforcing order that's coming in on the CMS. And so what has to happen there is that, well, it's not just good enough to accept it. You have to probably enter the child support start, start date, the end date, the dollar amount into your CMS field. So clerk does additional docketing. This process on average takes about four minutes. So you have about 7.5 minutes of human time being invested into processing a transaction that comes in from either an e-filer, or once again, this could be a scan transaction as opposed to an e-filer. This is what we do. Is we automate it. And how do we do that? So we have these software robots that sit on PCs or workstations or virtual machines that act as though they're a human entering keystrokes and doing a mouse clicks. So they sign onto the portal and they find documents that you're telling us you want to automate. The robots then take those documents and send them to our three different AI engines. First, we have an AI engine that does optical character recognition, essentially converting the image to usable text. We're using an AI-based engine because we can do handprint to the same levels of efficiency as machine print. That's not to say that we can do officer ticket chicken scratch that comes in from very, very poor, bad handwriting and emergency hurried situation, but reasonable handprint, similar of accuracy is machine print nowadays. Once we have a text layer that we can take actions on, we then will classify the document into the correct docket code that the system has been trained on. That allows us to do two things. That allows us to catch mistakes by the filer. So if a filer tells us that putting in a motion, but it's actually a notice, the AI classification engine will say, based upon the document content that it's read, it knows that it's a motion and not a notice, and therefore we could automatically reject it. Now, that's the primary class. That's the primary reason for classification. The secondary reason is, well, you may be filing a generic DACA code. 
because the state may want to limit the amount of information the attorneys need to know to file, so they may just say it's a motion. But you may have 200 different types of motions that exist on your CMS. So document classification can come in and based upon reading that document, say that, well, it's not just a generic motion, it's a specific motion. It's a motion to dismiss, let's say. So the second stage of classification is we can do generic docket code mapping to specifics. Once we have the appropriate docket code identified, we can then use another AI engine to locate data that's necessary to either accept or reject it on the portal. So for instance, the case number, the parties, um, uh, the county that it was filed in, things that your humans are looking for on the front end to make sure you can accept the document. But now that we actually know what the correct Docker code is, we actually know all the data entry requests that have to occur for that secondary person to do updates into the CMS. So the AI extraction engine will get all the information necessary to automate the submission, as well as all the information necessary to docket that uh, filing directly into your CMS for all the activities that your humans are doing after the fact. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have a common e-filing system that accepts all your court types, but you're running different CMSs for your different court types, robots can update multiple CMSs and we'll show that to you in the video too. Now, what makes our AI very interesting and unique in the machine learning AI space is that we have a concept of something called online learning, where when a human, and we'll show you where this occurs, makes a review of a document that has low confidence and makes changes to the data that was found by the AI engines, the AI engines take what that human has done and use it to learn to increase its knowledge level. Now, what this looks like in production processing is we're gonna show a video that Tarrant County Clerk of the Courts have made for us. And typically robots are never seen. They're running round the clock 24 by seven and they're running off of a virtual machine in some data center. But we've exposed them and we recorded what they're actually doing. So in a few seconds, you'll see a robot sign on to a file and start portal and act as though it was a user. Okay, so the first robot's job is essentially find work. It's going to sign onto the portal as a typical user, navigate to a specific court type queue, and look for a transaction that you told us you want to have automated. And its mission in life is to do nothing more than to open the transaction and lock it. So robots can work alongside of humans and be digital assistants essentially doing the Docker codes that are high volume or take a lot of time. So the first robot signs on, locks the envelope, and it's continually looking for the envelopes around the clock now. So your document review is no longer an eight by five process, it's 24 by seven by 365. Now the second robot does a little bit more work than the first robot does. It comes back on, navigates to the portal, finds the exact envelope that the first robot said, yes, we should automate. And it downloads the documents as PDF files. And sends them to the AI engines for OCR, document classification and data extraction. So now that the AI engines are essentially making structured data off of unstructured documents, when they're done, we have enough information necessary to process the case on the portal. But before that occurs, Tarrant specifically wanted to make sure that the CMS was in a state for that subsequent filing on an existing case to make sure that it could accept that document filing. So another robot's going to sign on now to the actual CMS, Case Manager Enterprise Justice, AKA Odyssey in this situation, take the case number that we extracted off the documents, entered into the CMS, 
and then find out that there are no case alerts. So essentially that case wasn't transferred, wasn't closed, can accept transactions. So at this point in time, we have enough information necessary to make an accept or reject decision at the portal. So the next robot is going to sign back onto the portal and start doing actual work to accept or reject documents attached to that filing. In the meantime, remember those other three robots are continuously looking for work, sending it to the AI. So it's a cooperative process between multiple robots. The robot comes in, finds a transaction, enters in the filing description and the filing comments, realizes that stamp is overlaying text, moves it to white space. And it's done with the first document. This is a two document transaction, a proposed order and motion to dismiss. It does additional data entry on the second document in the filing description and filing comments, realize that this is a proposed order, not the actual order. So it's going to actually remove that stamp. Robots don't make mistakes. Um, they don't take time off. They don't have personal problems. They're there all the time. If your volume goes up, you add more robots and you keep your workload and your time uh, constraints the same in terms of getting data processing out to the clients, out to your public uh, record site. So I've just shown you how AI and software bots can assist your staff by not having to do the mundane work of accepting or rejecting documents on e-filing submission. Sooner or later, that transaction shows up in your CMS. Now, the docketing that your clerks were previously having to do is now being done by yet another robot that is based upon the docket codes that show up for those documents that were filed. It's going to take a set of actions. We call them robot skills. In this case, it's going to expand the text that's on the docket description to contain who the actual filing party was and the name of the party. So when you look at your docket sheet, you have more descriptive information on the documents filed without having to open them up and figure out what the document was filed by and what parties. It's then going to relate the two events together. In a few seconds, it's actually, it's still adding the um, uh, text to the uh, extended docket description. Now it's going to relate the two documents together. It's going to put a stamp on a PDF saying who processed it. In this case, the name of the robot was CCBot1. It's going to create a workflow in a couple of seconds. So all the activities that were previously being done by humans are digitized and memorialized into robot skills that get replayed millions of times. The software is running, making no data entry mistakes at all, providing you consistent data entry across all your documents. So you're now witnessing the tail end of completely automating document intake from a e-filing and CMS update environment. Now, I told you that we have the ability to update multiple CMSs should you be using different vendors for your different core types. So what we've just shown you is file and serve automation for e-filing, Clerk Review, and I've showed you Odyssey updates. What we're gonna see next is a transaction that comes in from an e-filing portal, and the back end is not a Tyler product. It's actually Journal Technologies, the e-filing system. So in a few seconds, we're gonna see a robot come along sign on to journal, locate the case that the e-filing was meant for. And I think this is a return of subpoena or it's an issue of some subpoena, I'll know in a second. It locates the actual a summons, I'm sorry, a notice of service of summons. It finds the existing summons and it's going to put in, it was returned the date that it was served and who it was served upon. So now I've automated a non-Tyler CMS for different core type because they happen to be using a different multiple CMSs um, in their environment.
in addition, you don't have to just automate e-filing transactions. We have the ability to do any activity that humans were doing at a user interface in a screen. So if you have a set of time consuming operations that humans are previously doing in your CMS, where they actually sign on, they find a transaction, they review the document, they do additional data entry work. We actually now can take care of that processing automatically because software bots can sign on to the CMS, look for specific work that your humans were previously doing, download the documents to the AI engines to make structured data, and then provide the data back to the robots to do decision-making and data entry tasks. And we typically package this with robot skills. We have a library for robot skills that exists for different CMSs. So if you happen to be using Tyler Enterprise Justice, there's a CMS robot skill library for that. If you happen to be using Showcase or Journal, or um, there's probably 10 to 15 that we support, um, robots can automate, not just e-filing, but any of your CMS activities. Now, now that we've done the automation, let's talk a look, little bit about, well, it's technology is really cool. This is probably the coolest software the company from CSI's perspective has ever worked on in our career. Um, let's talk about what it actually gets you. So Palm Beach County was nice enough at a recent presentation to get up and show us and show the world what they were doing with our technology. Now, Palm Beach has chosen different core types to automate. They're not automating every single Docker code under the sun, what they automate is their own decision. But all the core types along the left-hand side, from circuit civil down to total criminal, I'm sorry, family, and then total civil and total criminal, in the period of time of one month, they've done, in one month last year, they did about 38,000 e-filings. Out of those 38,000, if you look at the bottom right, 42% were never seen by humans. So if they weren't using the AI software to doing their automation, they would have to actually look at roughly 19,000 or 18,000 more transactions than were previously being filed. So they're relatively happy. They're happy enough to go tell the world about what they're using the technology for. But they actually broke it down in terms of what it actually cost them and what it was saving them. So when they did their original calculations, they used the base salary, which we think is way underpriced at present, of $35,000 a year per person. And they added on all the perks and they said it came out to be about $57,000. Our recent math is that's about a $75,000 cost right now, but we'll stay with the $57,000 cost so we keep our slides consistent. When they first went live, they were doing 20 million pages per year and they put nine bots in production. And they realized that with the addition of the bots, they were able to allocate 45 data entry clerks to other projects. They didn't get rid of them. They didn't fire them. They just gave them happier jobs and having to sign on to portals because those staff members can now do what they do best, which is talk to other humans and essentially have a more productive workday than just saying, hey, I'm at my computer looking at data to uh, analyze it. So when they allocated those 45 staff to other projects, they were able to calculate that even though the cost of our software for them was $650,000 and they're doing 20 million pages, they're saving $1.9 million each year along the way. So financial savings plus happier staff. Okay. That's Palm Beach County. Tarrant County, Texas in 2022 won a NACO award. They applied for it because they're automating their e-filing review and CMS data entry. They were running two shifts and it was taking them 48 hours from once a human being submitter pressed send on the portal before it ended up in the CMS. They got the review time down to a few minutes. So uh, they're another one of our happy clients using the technology. So there's a couple of things to save here. You have monetary savings. Your staff can do other things. You can spend less cost on having to do document review and data entry. You have speed in terms of the information being made available now. From once the submitter presses submit, it's no longer waiting a couple hours, a couple of days. 
It's pretty much instantaneously based on what you have in your environment for processing the data for the AI engines to run on. There's a third environment or third element, which is something of news to us in that we're finding out that clerks are having a hard time finding staff. And we actually have a clerk that told us that, yes, they go out and they hire staff and the staff works about a couple of weeks and then they decide that, nope, they don't really want to look at documents and they quit. So the clerk has spent the money in finding the person, training them, et cetera, et cetera. So AI automation provides digital assistance that you do not have to worry about how you find staff. If Target is offering $2 more per hour than you're capable of doing from a private sector organization, the people are going to go to the higher paid jobs that um, uh, just based upon monetary policies. Um, so the concept of you save money on the with the technology, you have faster speed and greater data accuracy, and that you don't have to worry about staff problems becomes a no brainer situation in terms of can AI solve your problems in doing document review and data entry or essentially turbocharging your court? The answer is absolutely yes. So what makes our AI extremely special? Concept is something called AI online learning. Before I show that to you, I want to establish a baseline of what happens in traditional AI systems. When you initially set a system up, there's a step called supervised machine learning where a human being harvests documents, excuse me, you have to train the system. So you have to get copies of all your Docker codes and then you have to essentially tag them and tell the system, this is the information you wanted to find. Then the system goes off and trains and produces knowledge. Now that knowledge is used in production processing so that when new documents enter your workflow, that prior knowledge that was system was trained on gets applied, documents get classified, data gets extracted, data gets redacted, and then software bots go off and do their thing. Now, what happens in the situation when the AI knowledge is not sufficient to find all the information? That happens typically when you have new attorneys filing that use different formats of their documents, you, int you introduce a new DACA type, or you introduce a new field. But bottom line is, when those documents enter the system, there's no knowledge that exists for the AI to be able to locate your data, or there's not enough knowledge, so it's low confidence. So the system is smart enough to understand when there is not enough information in the training set, and it puts that document into a manual validation queue. And we're making your data entry people into data verification experts where they essentially look at the document and say, ah, there's something missing. They simply correct it by circling the image data. And then the system goes off and it gives the right data to the robots. It's 100% correct. But it uses the steps that the human was doing to create evaluation versions of knowledge. So these mini versions of knowledge. At the point in time they're created, we cannot actually use them because the humans could have been tired, making mistakes, not knowing what they're doing. So they could be doing bad data verification. You'll eventually catch it in your CMS because someone will come back and say, this is not the right data, what happened? So let's go find Sally and tell her to fix what she's doing. But the problem is if we had used that information in real time, we would make the AI system less accurate. So we actually have to keep that evaluation version of knowledge around. And when new documents come into the system, we actually process with the production version of knowledge and the evaluation version. And if the evaluation version makes the system more accurate, we actually promote it to production. Now, that's a lot of words. So I want to show you what this actually looks like from a production system. So we're going to open up an existing AI project using a piece of software called the Information Extraction Designer. Your end users never see this. Sometimes your business analysts would see it. And we're going to open up an existing AI model, a court document project with a couple hundred DACA codes. On the left are all the DACA codes that we're extracting unique information off of. At the parent level, there's a case number and parties that get extracted off of all of them. We're going to open up an E-rate of garnishment now. And we have the parent knowledge plus the dollar amount and defendant. And we're going to add a new field. We're going to say, well, we want to get the garnishee off of the document. 
So we're essentially creating a situation where the AI engine doesn't have knowledge to find the garnishee because we've never trained it. We're not going back and reharvesting documents. We're just going to start processing and create a situation where we're processing documents where there's no knowledge in terms of how to find the garnishee. So we process the documents been OCR, classified, data extracted, and the garnishee, which is on the document for Suncoast Medical, is not extracted. So the human being says, okay, well, I need to add this field to complete the transaction. And they do so by simply selecting the image information. And they say, let's finalize it. So the robots get the correct information. Now we're gonna go back to our online learning engine dashboard and take a look at what's going on. This has been set up to run manually. There's one version of knowledge, which is green. We're gonna to go to the garnishy field. And there's 0% accuracy because at this present moment in time, the AI engine does not know how to find that garnishy. We're gonna run the AI online learning engine. It's gonna say, ah, a human being made some changes. So I'm gonna build an evaluation version of knowledge. So I'm gonna go process the second document now. It's gonna be OCR, classified, data extracted. We're gonna go back to our validation station, refresh it. And it's gonna pop up again because we're still using the production version of AI knowledge because we don't have enough information to see if the evaluation version is good or not until we actually do this activity, which is correct the information off the second document. So the robot gets its corrected data. The online learning engine behind the scenes when it wakes up now has two versions of knowledge, green being production, gray being evaluation on the bottom bar charts. Production knowledge was 0% accuracy, but the evaluation version, if it had been used, would have been 100% accurate. So when online learning wakes up and runs again, it's gonna say, oh, I can make the production system more accurate by promoting evaluation version to production. So it's already promoted the eval to production, and we're gonna process our third document. It's gonna be OCR, classified, extracted. We're gonna go back to our validation client, refresh it. Typically this would not show up here because it's 100% correct, but we put it in here manually so that you can see that yes, by the operations done by the humans, the AI system has improved automatically without anybody having to call your vendor saying my accuracy is diminishing. And now I have 100% accurate garnish C field. And I have another version of evaluation knowledge, which is the version three. So anytime humans make changes, um, we continuously build evaluations. So essentially we have an AI system that heals itself. As your documents change, you do not have to get involved and call vendors and say that your accuracy is diminishing. This is a real world graph of Palm Beach County when they first started out all their docking codes on the left-hand side that the AI was processing. On the right-hand side on the bottom in green are the amount of volume that they're processing per month over a 10 month period of time, roughly 40,000 transactions per month. And the accuracy on all fields across all documents is 98 to 98.5%, which is pretty much unheard of in AI projects. So it allows us to maintain extremely high levels of accuracy when documents change over time. Okay, so some of you may have seen this presentation or different pieces of it before, but what I want to talk about next in my next seven minutes is what we're doing new for this year. So, you may know that we have OCR Handprint, an AI-based engine where we can take handprint or poor text over shaded backgrounds. So the left-hand side is the actual image, the right-hand side is the actual results. But you may not know that we put it off of these pieces of hardware called graphic processing units. What's very interesting about the graphic processing unit is the speed. Whoops, I need to move this so you can see this. A typical page to be OCR off of a standard piece of equipment called a central processing unit or CPU is four seconds or 4,000 milliseconds. A GPU processes that same page 100 times faster in 40 milliseconds. So we've just solved the problem over you having to have expensive high volume clusters of CPUs to do OCR processing 
there are roughly 28,800 seconds in an eight hour workday. So a single CPU in that eight hour workday can process 7,200 pages. So if you're doing a whole lot of volume, you're gonna need to have a bunch of CPUs processing your uh, documents for OCR. The GPU can process 72,000 pages in an eight hour workday. The CPU equivalent uh, that 7,200 pages per day comes out to be 1,728,000 pages per year. A single GPU, and not the very expensive ones, can do 172 million pages per year in an eight-hour workday. So bottom line is we're now very fast, and we've solved the problem over having to OCR documents um, in very fast uh, amount of time. Next, I've mentioned that we're using large language models in document classification. So we read a document, then we classify it by its content. So the test set that we're using, this is actually Palm Beach production data. On the bottom right-hand side, using traditional AI, which is the statistical math only, we're able to successfully classify those documents 89% of the time. Using nothing more than changing out our algorithms, we increased the accuracy by plus 10%, they were now 99.5% accurate on document classification, which is far greater than humans are possible of doing manually. So we solve a problem while we're making so that your document codes are correct. In addition, this is a test set of the 142 document codes. We're expanding it to do full repositories. We've recently done a 457 document code uh, environment, which has 45,000 documents in the training set and our accuracy models are still 99.5%. So we can now say that we classify documents better than any piece of software on the market and also better than any human is capable of doing. Next, we're adding large language models to document text extraction. And I want to bring this up to show you a couple of interesting test cases. So if you were using our technology in the past to find document titles and to extract them, here's some challenges. Here's three different documents where the title single line on the top left, and you have multiple lines on the bottom left, but the only the bottom lines underline. But then on the right-hand side, you have a title that's multi-lines with uh, underlined on everything. So interesting combinations of how to find titles there. It gets even more interesting when you have uh, combined documents. So a certificate of service on your left-hand side is secondary or standalone from a certificate of service document, which is actually a supplemental request for evidence. So challenges are when you have multiple documents combined within the same document type, which is why you have that 89% um, accuracy rate using current statistical technology. It's just not great enough to be able to find all these interesting combinations. You also have it when the titles are multi-column. They're no longer just within the document. They're happening to be in the case to off the right-hand side. So um, name extraction too, that's another typically problematic child. This happens to be from land records documents, but grant or grantee, same type of issues that exist when you're doing victims, minors, maiden, names of that nature. Bottom line is traditional AI statistical can get you 84% off of court document titles, 75 to 78% off of names, but doing nothing more than using our latest software engines, which are using large language models, we're now plus 15% to plus 23% more accurate than we were before in the past without having to have human labor do any refinements for your AI models. So what do all these magical numbers mean? We're, we're up 10% here, or up 15% here, up 23% there. It means that we're now a whole lot more lights out. So if you saw from the, if you remember from the Palm Beach slide, we were at 43 to 44% in terms of what they were not having to touch. Using large language models in our testing, that number jumps up 40%. Okay, that's unheard of in the AI space. Typically, AI engineers are working very hard to get one to 2%. To get 10 to 23% on individual fields and doc classification, which result in a 40% difference on having to have lights out, um, we're way above and beyond what anybody else is doing in the market space. That's why I'm saying that we're essentially delivering staff happiness. Our software just happens to be the mechanism that your staff gets happy now. If you implement our solution, you have a huge amount of less work to do than you're previously using when you're just not using AI. Now, why Tyler? Well, 
our typical implementation is very quick. It's not a multi-year project. We have this down to a science. We can do your first 20 to 25 Docker codes, which is your highest volume within 90 days from contract signing to going to production. And we have reference customers that will attest to that. We've been doing this since 2017. We've actually created the market. So we're the experts in this field. Possibly one of the reasons why Tyler wanted to acquire CSI is because this is what we're really good at. Our AI is the best in the market. The Department of Defense, the city of New York have all gone out for bidding processes, multi-years using third-party consultants and have selected us because of what's shown you with online learning and large language models. Now, we've also packaged all of those robot things that were being done by a robot signing on, clicking on keys and using the mouse into robot skills. So there's libraries that get certified for each CMS vendor that we process so that when you get a CMS update, the robot skills always match. We have reference customers that are very happy to stand up and tell you exactly how much that they're uh, saving in terms of time and money. And then also very, very happy staff. And I think that's it for my presentation. So I'm open for questions and answers. Um, if anybody has any, um, any, you want to start with anything that might be pending and then we'll take it on the fly. Yeah, so the first question is, how much time do clients save when they start using e-filing e automations? So typically when we're done with the initial project, you're picking the highest volume document types and we're seeing between 40 and 50% of human labor on the initial document types and going up to, uh, from what you saw in the last slide from one of our California customers that was um, in a benchmark of 80%. Okay, awesome. Next question, this person has two parts to their question. We don't use e-filing yet. Can you automate our scanning process? Can your software process existing dockets and identify and correct those that we have filed incorrectly? Okay, so the answer is yes to the first part, which is e-filing automation only happens to be one of the applications of using the AI to make structured data off of unstructured documents. And yes, we do exist within scanning workflows at different clients that don't have e-filing automation. The second question is actually kind of interesting, the second part of that second question, in that when we started doing not just the docket codes that the client wants to automate, but all the docket codes in their repository to create these classification models. What we're finding out is that roughly five to 12% of your filings that we're seeing in existing CMSs are incorrect. So the answer is yes, we can actually use the AI model that's built correctly to classify your documents to actually clean up all the incorrect filings that you've been doing over the years via manual labor. Okay, and um, a question by Sam is, has this been used for case initiating documents that have fees? In other words, can it ensure the filer paid the correct fee? Yes, we have different clients using it for case initiation and it does fee calculations based upon whatever your humans are previously doing. Brian's question is, how does OCR compare to either AWS Textract or Azure's Forms Recognizer? We blow them away. I have specific stats on benchmarking it against those two vendors, as well as Microsoft, as well as DeepRead out of um, Japan. The actual AI engine itself is TensorFlow version 2, and there's several hundred million character snippets that go into the models that we rebuild based upon uh, need. All right, question from Robert is, how about pri privacy? Is all the processing done on the device or is there a cloud element involved? Our implementations are typically nowadays SaaS. However, we do have customers that run on-prem. They're very high secure environments. The Department of Defense is on-prem because they're running off of top secret networks, as well as some of our commercial private sector banking and healthcare are on-prem. Okay, and then a question from Patrick is, your product prefers GPUs. In virtual machines, there are no dedicated GPUs. What have you seen as the impacts of using VMs compared to dedicated machines with GPUs optimized? Okay, so a bunch of questions there. So let me see if I can break it out because I may have caused some confusion. 
We don't require GPUs. We run off of CPUs natively. That's not a problem at all. We've been using CPUs for our software for the past five years. But within the past probably year and a half, two years, we've added support so that if a GPU happens to be present and available for use, the system will automatically um, de detect it and make use of it. Okay, awesome. And then someone had just commented, this looks as something similar would be great for helping convert paper records to digitized and file records into a document management system. Just wanted to see if you had anything to expand on that. Yeah, so we actually do this for backfile conversions. So if you have a, a warehouse full of paper that you want to get into your CMS and you don't want to have to scan all your PDFs um, let's say all your different physical filings in one document type, um, the system will actually read all, you can scan all your documents in and we'll process the batch. We'll separate the documents. If you send in 50 documents as a blob, we'll actually separate and classify the documents to data extraction and the robots would be data entry for you too. So we've used it for back scanning projects as well as CMS conversions. Okay, another two-part question. They said, I see you've indicated you have at least two statewide implementations. How does the system handle both statewide and local business requirements? Can it learn when to switch between statewide versus local processes, especially when local processes may vary across that state? So the person that wrote the question, please take my email down. It's not on the slides. My apologies. It's hsal, I'm sorry, henry.sal at tylertech.org or follow up at NACOM. And we'll take this one offline. But the answer is yes, we do statewide um, rules and then county-based rules come into play. It, and we handle that by having two different AI models, one for the state and one at the county level. Okay, and then somebody asked, are you using a commercially available LLM model and fine tuning it or inbuilt model? So we're using BERT large language two at present and we're refining it with the documents that are in the customer set after we've trained it on our base knowledge level already. And that may change in terms of what we end up using in the future, but at present the stuff is uh, BERT. All right, that's all the questions we have today. Um, if your answer was, un if you have more questions, feel free to fill out that survey that will pop up after this webinar and we can be in touch with you for that. Okay, Henry, that's all for the questions. All right, thank you all for attending.